In other words, it must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. <laughs> Why, hello, my fellow apes. Welcome back to the torture that is Frank Turek's intellectual constipation. I know that can give you intellectual constipation. The reason that we believe Christianity is true is because the answer to four questions is yes. Now, I gave my own four questions last time, but for giggles, let's add an extra per response. Here's this one. Will you gish gallop like there's no tomorrow? Yes. We spoke briefly about gish galloping in the last installment, during which we tackled Tarek's first reason. But since this technique, or more accurately a very similar technique, plays such a crucial role throughout his second reason, and indeed his apologetics in general, I'm going to give it proper introduction. The term Gish Gallop is named after the young Earth creationist Dwayne Gish, who overwhelmed his opposition with a rapid series of specious arguments, half-truths, and misrepresentations, making it impossible for them to adequately respond within reasonable time. Well, I usually refer to the theory of evolution as the fish to Gish theory, so we understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Likewise to most apologists, Tarek utilizes the Gish Gallop technique in debates, unconsciously or otherwise, but he also employs the same method in his apologetic sermons. Now, strictly speaking, this isn't gish galloping, as there's no explicit opposition, and so I'd like to christen this monologue version Turek Trotting. Whereas gish galloping involves rapid misinformation and half-truths to overwhelm the opposition, Turek Trotting is done at a calmer pace since there is no direct opposition to offer refutation. Alright, so with this on the table, let's get to Turek's second question. Question number two, does God exist? The second question is, does God exist? Is there really a being out there known as God. There are several arguments for the existence of God. Let me just give you one. Is there evidence for that kind of being? being? Yes, there's very good evidence. Three lines of evidence. Yep, that's right. In the graduation presentation, we got not one, but two bonus arguments. We'll get to them in time, but first, let's hear the primary, starting with the punchy rendition. Oh, and if you can, watch out for the Turek trotting. Even atheists today are admitting that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. Well, think about this, friends. If space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. That trot was 27 seconds long. 65 words. And yet the number of unsubstantiated claims was really quite astonishing. Remember, he's presenting an argument. There are several arguments for the existence of God. And yet all we got was assertion after assertion after assertion with no evidence whatsoever. To just scratch the surface, he claimed that space had a beginning. Space. That matter had a beginning. Matter. And that time had a beginning. Time. And he offered precisely bugger all in terms of evidence. Well, to this, we need only swing Hitchens' razor. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I want to play a game. I want to play a game. As you hear the graduation version, I want to encourage you all to note how many claims Turek makes and how many arguments or how much evidence he provides for each claim. Good luck. The first piece of evidence is that the universe exploded into being out of nothing. Once there was no space, once there was no matter, once there was no time, and then the entire space-time continuum leapt into existence. Even atheists are admitting this now. Even Stephen Hawking, who's an atheist, says, almost everyone now believes that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. If that's the case, whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter, right? In other words, it must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, also intelligent because this universe is also fine-tuned, which is the second line of evidence that, the, that God exists. Now, when you think of a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? That's what we mean by a theistic God. Did you keep count? I mean, I got 11, but there's probably more. In any case, let's go through it again, this time visually noting each and every assertion. The first piece of evidence is that the universe exploded into being out of nothing. Once there was no space, once there was no matter, once there was no time, and then the entire space-time continuum leapt into existence. Even atheists are admitting this now. Even Stephen Hawking, who's an atheist, says, almost everyone now believes that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. Okay, stop. We're not even halfway, but that will do for now. 
In 23 seconds, 67 words, Turek has made seven assertions, and so let's slow down and address each at a time. He opens by claiming that the universe exploded out of nothing. The first piece of evidence is that the universe exploded into being out of nothing. As always, I recommend watching his sermon in full if you can stomach it, if only to confirm my saying that throughout he offers no argument or evidence for this extraordinary claim. None. Most apologists at least misrepresent Big Bang cosmology, but in this case, Turek doesn't even do that. Hence, Hitchens' razor is more than suffice. We can move on. However, since there's a lot of misinformation around the Big Bang, and this assertion exploits said misinformation, I think it's worth emphasising that despite many theologians and apologists very confidently claiming, as Turek does here, that the universe exploded out of nothing, the actual physicists, you know, the people with actual PhDs, don't. To really hammer home this fact, I'm going to show you just three physicists contradicting Turek, with the last, Rodney Holder, also being a theologian. We use the phrase, the Big Bang, to refer to that earliest moment of the history of the universe where we don't understand what is going on. It's a placeholder for our lack of understanding. So it could be that the answer to the question of what happened before the Big Bang is, a lot of other Big Bangs, or a lot of other quantum events that were taking place in a larger landscape of reality than we have direct access to. Certainly it looks like our uh, uh, space-time realm has a beginning, but whether that can be identified with the beginning of the universe, I would be uh, unsure about. And actually, I've been reluctant to, um, and indeed, I simply haven't done it, made an argument about um, for the existence of God from the universe having a beginning. As a side note, I appreciate that a minority of viewers find my having fun at the expense of apologists a little unpalatable. But in all seriousness, let me ask you this. How else should we respond to those that confidently misrepresent things in order to further their religious and political ambitions? It's not like Turek is merely claiming that he's convinced by some argument or piece of evidence. No, he's asserting his belief as unanimous fact, all whilst misrepresenting actual evidence, physicists, and indeed some theologians. In what other form of discourse do acts such as this demand respect? The hubris of these humble apologists is revolting. It's an insult to earnest theists who genuinely find these arguments convincing. And whilst earnest theists don't embody such arrogance themselves, they seldom call out their ilk that do. So I, as an atheist, will. Much of Turek's apologetic preaching is profoundly irresponsible, and his misrepresentation of cosmology is but one example. Once there was no space- This claim is but one of many that utilises the general public's ignorance of Big Bang cosmology, and whilst there are some arguments and evidence in its favour, Turek doesn't reference any of them in either of his presentations. And so, the razor has its way once again. I'm not going to give this any more attention than Turek did. Once there was no matter- Again, Turek offers no argument or evidence, so uh, let's move on. Once there was no time- For the same reason, let's move on. And then the entire space-time continuum leapt into existence. Now here's a question. What does it even mean to say that then the entire space-time continuum leapt into existence? The very notion of then is predicated on time. There can't be a then before time, just as there can't be a north beyond the north pole. Even atheists are admitting this now. Are they now? According to what source? How does Turek know this? I guess we'll have to take it on faith, as he offers nothing tangible. But do you know what? Let's assume for reductio that every single atheist on the entire planet admitted that the totality of everything, the grand universe, began to exist out of nothing. What would this achieve? Nothing. This is just an appeal to popularity, and a false one. According to the Correspondence Theory of Truth, which, if you recall, Tarek champions throughout his first reason, belief has precisely no effect at all on truth. Further still, even if the universe is temporally finite, this wouldn't be a problem for atheists, as such a case is perfectly compatible with a worldview absent gods. Time could be, for instance, an emergent property of specific matter. Such a discovery wouldn't have me on my knees. Even Stephen Hawking, who's an atheist, says, Almost everyone now believes that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. It would have been nice for Turek to have at least shared where he got this quote from, because no result comes up on search engines. But notice that the quote that Turek offers is of a brilliant scientist expressing a fact about what most people, most laymen, believe. What does that achieve? Imagine me quoting the renowned Christian C.S. Lewis saying that most academics are atheists, or most people are not Christians. What would quoting him, as opposed to anyone off the street, achieve? 
Now, before we move on to Tarek's second argument, I want to respond to one more thing. If that's the case, whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter, right? More often than not, apologists group space, time, and matter into a simultaneous beginning, and this enables them to claim that whatever created all three must be without all three. Clever move. But what if, say, time had a beginning but matter didn't? Well, we'd have, for instance, the hypothesis that time is an emergent property of some form of matter, and the apologist would be left empty-handed. Alright, so I've taken the time to thoroughly break down Tarek's first argument for God's existence, as it's his primary argument. It is indeed the only argument he provides in his punchy version. But from here on out, I'm going to succinctly interject to the core of his arguments. As much as I'd like to still man his assertions and bring into the frame the surrounding literature, it takes just a few seconds to spew vomit, but hours to clean it. And I'm done cleaning. The second piece of evidence is the fine-tuning of the universe, that if you were to change any one of a number of factors just imperceptibly about the universe, for example, if you were to change, say, the gravitational force by more than one part in 10 to the 40, we wouldn't be here. As already said, I'm fighting the urge not to delve deeper into fine-tuning, and so I'm just going to offer one response. If we were to roll 5d6, the chance of any specific sequence turning up is 1 in 7,776. That's very unlikely. Increase the sequence to just 10, and the chances are 1 in over 60 million. That's very, very unlikely. Does this somehow prove that Zeus is guiding every die? No, of course not. Also, think about your amazing biology. Do you know there's a word inside of you it's in your genome. Every one of your 40 trillion, says, it's trillion cells has a word that's 3.5 billion letters long. All the letters are in the right order. Putting aside the semantic issues, by saying the right order, Tarek is presuming that there is a right order, that there is an order that's been consciously determined by a being. He is thus begging the question. Furthermore, it's some order, isn't it? Children being born with life-threatening deformities, cancer, sudden heart failure, and brain aneurysms being a thing, viruses with their own right order annihilating innocent populations, and the list goes on and on. Secondly, Tarek is cherry-picking from centuries of scientific discovery, as if science is just some big buffet. He's more than happy to take the slice that is the sequence of our genome, but he ignores the slices either side that overwhelmingly support evolution by natural selection. Gene duplication, for instance, which occurs when a stretch of genetic code is duplicated and reinserted into a creature's DNA, demonstrates how new information, a longer word, can and indeed has emerged through natural means. John Perry of Stated Clearly has a fantastic video on this very topic, in which he provides the examples of Daxon's odd-shaped legs, the unique digestive system of leaf-eating monkeys, and the evolution of snake venom. I highly recommend checking it out. So, if a god does exist, she's certainly rewriting her code, which implies she's probably not omnipotent. The third argument for God after the beginning, the sustaining and fine-tuning, is the moral argument. And this is going to be big on a college campus. But all, the only point I want to make here is, if there's just one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, then there has to be a god. Why? Because if there is no God, if there is no being beyond humanity, then that's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion. Many theists define objective morality in such a way that only a cosmic law ordained by a supernatural consciousness would count as objective morality. In Turret's case, this is given away by his words off. Because if there is no God, if there is no being beyond humanity, then that's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion. Because he defines morality in such a way, it follows by definition that the type of objective morality he's insisting upon can't exist without a god. And so, sure, this kind of objective morality can't exist without a god. Get over it. This is nothing more than an appeal to emotion. It's akin to saying, if we don't have a large amount of expendable cash, then we can't afford to go on a luxurious cruise with Turret. Yep, that's true. Tough. Or lucky. Oh, and once again, have a shot for Hitch. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. Genuinely, I really, really appreciate it. One day, stealing a page from Tarek, I'll take you all on a canoe to the Isle of Wight for five easy payments of $9,999. But you'll have to make your own way back.